Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our software computing roundtable. The first we've had in quite a while, I I realize. I think July is our last one, uh, not least because we had the uh, Future Trends in Nuclear Physics Computing workshop um, a couple months ago. So here we are in uh, December with a very interesting meeting on electron ion collider software. Um, first, we're going to have a talk from Marcus Diefenthaler of JLab on uh, statement of software principles, um, which grew out of first and foremost a determination on part of the on the part of the EIC software community to establish a set of software principles um, before they get going on um, defining their software. Um, and um, in its content, it was informed by many things, but including um, the 2020 uh, Future Trends in Nuclear Physics Computing Workshop outcomes that uh, we had. Uh, and um, the software principles informed the development of the IC software stack, um, which uh, played out in a very impressive way. And um, it'll be very interesting to hear, and we thought it would be very useful to expose this to wider community uh, from Sylvester um, on how this stack came together and what it is, an example of a brand new um, experiment enterprise defining their software. So let's get going with um, Marcus on statement of software principles. I'll drop the share and you can pick it up, Marcus. Thank you very much, Torres. So I, I will um, introduce the EIC software um, statement of uh, principles. And um, I will do this in the context of what has been the history of EIC software and also present what has been the motivation um, for this um, statement of software principles. Um, a short um, overview about what the electron ion collider is. It will be the world's first no. collider of uh, polarized electrons and polarized protons. It will be the world's first collider of uh, polarized electrons and light ions, so deuteron and helium-3. And it also will be the world's first collider of electrons and heavy ions, heavy ions up to uranium. Um, the science goal of the EIC, if one can summarize this in one sentence, is the precision study of the um, nucleon and the nucleus at the scale of C quarks and gluons over all of the kinematic range that is relevant. Um, um, both uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory and Jefferson Lab will be the host labs um, for the EIC. So not one host lab, two host labs, and the uh, leadership roles in the project are shared. Um, um, First organized effort on EIC software started in 2016 with the EIC Software Consortium. The EIC Software Consortium was then asked by the EIC user group forming in 2018 um, to uh, be um, its, um, the foundation for its software working group. Um, the software working group um, um, helped and was instrumental with the Yellow Report initiatives and also the detector collaboration proposals for the EIC. I will talk a little bit about this um, later. And then starting from this year, we have uh, the first scientific collaboration for the EIC forming. The name is EPIC and EPIC has a computing uh, and software and also simulation production and QA um, a working group. Related to efforts re uh, re to EIC software, are uh, uh, this workshop series on future trends in nuclear physics computing that also started in 2016. And as an outcome of the first workshop, um, they, they, we started in, in 2016, the software and computing roundtable where we're discussing um, here uh, right now. Um, as, as soon as we started to have a more organized effort, there was also emerging vision then for software and computing at the electron ion collider. Um, one of the pioneers for computing, Richard Hemming, uh, really inspired a lot of our work by saying the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. So how can we build the software and computing um, to really um, um, take the um, best out of the, the EIC and, and reach um, the best of, of our science goals? 
And this mission is, is built around about two aspects. Aspect number one, software and computing are an integral part of our research. And we really would like to ensure with EIC that scientists of all level, um, not only at the facility, but really worldwide with the whole international community can participate in the EIC analysis actively. And that really means that we need to engage with the wider community in a development on the software. And that really brings us to user-centered design. The other aspect is we really would like to have a, a rapid turnaround of data for the physics analysis and the start of the work of the publications. So our goal is to have analysis ready data from the DEX system. And that really means that we need to have a compute detector integration with artificial intelligence at the DAC and at the analysis level. Um, we are far away from this vision. Um, EIC software is in a, in a very um, early life stage. Um, we started um, with um, a common software project, um, which um, are based on um, an expression of interest for EIC software, which has been done by the wider community. Um, and that has been motivated partially by um, really avoiding a duplication of the effort. We don't need 10 groups working on distributed computing for the EIC. We can work together on this and many, many other aspects of EIC software. And we really face challenges and we need to team up there, for instance, running on heterogeneous computing resources. In the past years, there have been two major initiatives which really helped us to put EIC software on a next level. The first one was the yellow report um, now being uh, has been published and it describes the physics case, the resulting detector requirements and the evolving detector concepts for the EIC. At that time, we were mainly doing fast simulations and uh, full simulations of um, detector components and um, the um, yellow report really laid uh, the um, foundation then for the next step, the detector collaboration proposals. The detector collaboration proposals um, have been very successful in large scale, um, detailed um, full detector simulations. So instead of, we had some before some full simulations of detector components, but now we were seeing for the first time um, full detector simulations for the full integrated um, EIC detector. One protocol collaboration, Athena, uh, successfully developed a modular software stack um, based on common software, nuclear and high energy physics. And another um, um, protocol collaboration has been also very successful in its science goals, um, um, successfully leveraged um, familiar um, software in, in, in the community. Um, after the yellow reports and after the detector collaboration proposals, we did state of software service to really get um, 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 an idea about um, software in the EIC community and, and what uh, the opinion about that. And, and, and there were two main themes here is really commonality, one software stack. People don't want to learn two, three, four tools. They want to not learn one tool and know that this works with everything in, in the whole community. So after this detector collaboration proposes, the EIC user group organized some lesson learned meeting to identify commonality between um, the, the impressive amount of work which has been done by uh, the Athena and Exa protocol collaborations, and then uh, proceed uh, with work on um, one um, software step. Um, so how to do that? I mean, it's, it's okay to have, or it's very good already to have this goal. We want to have one software stack, but then uh, of course people come and say, yes, and this is how we should do that or this is how we should do that. So, um, and in particular, when we do that, how do we ensure that we work towards our vision of EIC computing? And at the same time, how do we ensure that we meet the needs of the EIC community, which want to do simulations um, for physics and detector studies now and do not want to wait until this vision for EIC software has been, has been realized. So um, the solution to that uh, have been um, the statement of, of principles. So we started a community process where we really invited the whole EIC community um, to um, 
uh, actively take part in that. And again, not only developers of software, but really people who use the software for science and use the results of that software um, for science, uh, physics studies, detector studies. Um, and um, the, part, the goal of this community process it was to define guiding principles for EIC software with the understanding that then these guiding principles um, define the requirements for EIC software. And then as a result of this community process, we really wanted to have this as something which is endorsed by the international community. Um, so we are started and we are still continuing um, collecting um, people in the community to say, I endorsed that this, this really, in my opinion, represents um, the vision of the, for the EIC, but also the needs and, um, for, for, for the community. So let me go through um, the statement of principles one by one. Um, we start with principle one, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we aim to develop a diverse workforce uh, while also cultivating an environment of equity and inclusivity, as well as a culture of belonging. The second principle is about the uh, compute detector integration. So we will have a common software stack for online and offline software, including the processing of streamed data and its time ordered structure. We aim for autonomous alignment and calibration. Um, we aim for a rapid near real-time turnaround of the raw data to online and offline productions. Principle three, heterogeneous computing. We will enable distributed workflows on the computing resources of the worldwide EIC community, leveraging not only high throughput computing, but also high performance computing systems. EIC software should be able to run on as many systems as possible while supporting specific system characteristics for instance, accelerators such as GPUs were beneficial. Um, we will have a modular software design with structures robust against changes in the computing environment so that changes in the underlying code can be handled without an entire overhaul of the structure. Principle four, user-centered design. We will enable scientists of all levels worldwide to actively participate in the science program of the EIC keeping the barriers low for smaller teams. EIC software will run on the systems used by the community easily. We aim for modular development paradigm for algorithms and tools without the need for users to interface with the entire um, software environment. Principle five, um, open, simple, and self-descriptive data formats. Um, so we will favor simple flat data structures and formats to encourage collaboration with computer data and other scientists outside of nuclear and high energy physics. We aim for access to um, EIC data to be simple and straightforward. Principle six, reproducible software, data and analysis preservation will be an integral part of EIC software and the workflows of the community. We aim for fully reproducible analysis that are based on reusable software and are amenable to adjustments and new interpretations. Principle seven about the community, and, and that for instance brings us back to um, future trends in nuclear physics computing. Um, Tora mentioned the 2020 workshop. They really were talking about um, software as, as, a, as a community process and the important role of community in software and common software projects. And we really aim to, we will embrace the, the community. Um, so EIC software will be open source with attribution to its um, con contributors. We will use publicly available productivity tools. EIC software will be accessible by the whole community. We will ensure that mission critical software components are not dependent on the expertise of a single developer, but managed and maintained by a core group. We will not reinvent the wheel, but rather aim to build on and extend existing efforts in the wider scientific community. We will support the community with active training and support sessions where experienced software developers and users um, interact with new users. Uh, we will support the careers of scientists who dedicate their time and effort towards software and development. 
The last principle is about development and operation. So we will provide a production ready software stack um, throughout the development. Uh, we will not separate software development from software use and support. We are committed to providing a software stack for EIC science that continuously evolves and can be used to achieve all EIC milestones. We will deploy metrics to evaluate and improve the quality of our software. We aim to continuously evaluate, adapt, develop, validate, and integrate new software workflow and computing practices. That brings me then to the end of my short presentation. I shared um, a vision for EIC software and computing with two main aspects, user-centered design, so that really scientists of all levels worldwide can take part in EIC analysis actively, um, and also a rapid turnaround of data for physics analysis and um, to start early with, with the publications. So really to have um, a rapid research cycle at the, at the EIC. Um, the statement of principles represent guiding principles for EIC software. I linked to your website where you can read uh, them um, and also a PDF version. Um, we originally aimed for only one page. We end up, ended up with two pages where these guiding principles um, um, are written down. And they have been also endorsed by the international EIC community. Um, the um, web page has a list of, of, the, of the endorsers. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to give um, um, special thanks to um, Amber Bühnlein, Andrea Brezan, um, Bauter de Konig, Rolf Ent, um, Jin Wang, um, Sylvester Josten, David Lawrence, uh, Graham Stewart, um, um, Tore, um, Rick Yoshida, um, who really um, have been um, instrumental in this work, in guiding this work, in in a discussion of, of, the, of the last years. And of course, because this list is not com uh, uh, complete, everyone in the EIC user group software working group uh, um, and um, now the new Epic Computing Software and Simulation Production and QA working groups, where we really have um, an active community which is excited about um, um, working with these guiding principles and really um, steering um, EIC software and computing into something that when EIC starts, we really can be proud of what we have achieved and, and how software and computing is an integral part which really helps us to accelerate um, and advance um, nuclear science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. That was great. Um, on to question comments, but let me mention that we do have live notes. I dropped a link to it in uh, the chat and it's also on Indico. So questions, comments. Anyone see any pencil hey. missing? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <Great. laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Marcus, for, for running over that. They're, they're really nice. Um, my question, I suppose, really is, you know, it's all very well to establish these principles, but I wonder if you, did you find that any of them were more difficult to execute than others when it came to actually making practical choices? For instance, you talked about um, having open data formats that could be shared with the wider scientific community. Um, on the other hand, we in, in high energy physics in particular, we've really gone behind the root data format, which is now evolving to a completely new version. That's not necessarily easy for other people to use, but it seems to offer our community compelling advantages in terms of storage space and read speed. and so on and so forth. How, how, how does one tension those things when, when they come up? Or were there other areas where you felt that, ah, there's you know two principles which are pulling in different directions here? Um, this is a very good question. So I, let me give you maybe three e e examples here. So first of all, let me point out that these are guiding principles. Um, we, uh, the, this document was created this year and we have not realized um, all, all, all of these points. So we cannot, um, this is where we want to work towards. Um, this is not what we, what we 
have. Um, you already pointed out one which is very difficult to realize, um, and that is open data. So uh, giving people access to um, simulation data and data on real data, which also has um, an enormous um, sociological barrier. And of course comes out of the question, um, how open can a collaboration be because with also competition and, and, and something. So this is something which is completely open. There is also um, another aspect which is completely open is data analysis preservation, where we started some discussion but have not made um, good progress that we can say we have a really clear idea how to do this for the electron ion collider. Uh, we, we have started with continuous integration and, and having um, reproducible results there. Um, so this is extremely helpful, but this is just the first step in, in, in this direction. So this is maybe point number one. These are guiding principles. And um, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 um, the, there's a lot of work needed to realize all the points which are in, in here. The second, um, and, and maybe also while I say this, um, also something like career support. So um, this, is, this is a big topic and we just started with working in, in this direction. The second point, writing these soft um, um, and, and agreeing on these statement of principles has been work because um, there have been many discussions like for instance, um, the, the future role of heterogeneous computing. And then um, uh, um, Sylvester will show in his talk how helpful um, the, uh, the um, statement of principles have been, but now that we execute them, we already find, well, um, this modularity, which we emphasize twice, um, um, it is, is, is really important, but as soon as you start doing code and doing this with some, with some time pressure, you, you maybe break down this modularity. And we, have, we had now last week, the first discussion where we discussed how do we improve our reconstruct, reconstruction software stack to really ensure that that modularity and not by by accident go actually back in a direction of, of a monolithic framework which no one in the community would would like to have um, so that was my long answer to your to your question thank you for your long answer it was illuminating other questions comments Okay, onward to the software, and Sylvester Houston is going to tell us the very interesting story of the development of EIC, in particular Epic Software, uh, in the last months. Hello, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, you should see an empty desktop. Yep, right up to okay. date. Now you should see an empty desktop with slides on top of it. Yep, all good. Okay, great. Yeah, so I will be talking about the software stack that we have developed at the EPIC experiment. I will go a little bit about the process, about how we pick the solutions that we picked and why we picked them, and how we you know, uh, see ourselves uh, stepping forward. So it's a bit of a snapshot in time. Um, it's just my name here on this slide, but this is really the work of um, a large group um, of people, of course, uh, that are working on the software for the EPIC experiment. So what is the, uh, actually, before I start it, um, let me just go through an outline. Um, so I will be starting from actually the lessons that we learned from already quite a few years of doing software development for the Electron Ion Collider. Um, I will go briefly again over some of the material Marcus uh, presented, which is a statement of principles, but more about how we actually took that um, and which parts of that we took when we made decisions about the software stack for the electron ion collider. Uh, then I'll go towards our unified software strategy. I will go over our, you know, the roads that we actually took to get there. Then I will go over our different components. And um, then I, I'll say a few words about, you know, what does this software actually mean for say another detector at the electron ion collider? What could this mean? So what is the EPIC collaboration? So the EPIC collaboration right now is um, working on the only experiment um, supported by the project for the electron ion collider. It's for nuclear physics, a large collaboration. So currently 
or at least half a year ago, it was over 160 institutions. And I know we're continuously growing, so we're probably larger than this, uh, actually, at this point. Um, early into the collaboration process, uh, we um, surveyed the different groups uh, what their possible um, fields for contribution could be. And 49 groups indicated com commitment to work on software for the EIC, of which 22 also want to contribute to computing, which is more commitment really than any other uh, group um, at uh, any other group or topic at the um, electron ion collider. So there's definitely a lot of interest for our, from different groups, and we have a um, you know a very nice, uh, vibrant ecosystem of developers. Um, so. How did we get where we are right now? And um, so we really, you know, it, it makes sense to go back a few years and um, that is exactly what we did a little less than a year ago when we went through a process which we called the lessons learned process, um, which is really the lessons we learned from years of EIC simulations. Um, the reason for this is that um, we had the formation of the um, project collaboration, which is now called the EPIC collaboration. And we wanted to make sure we can really hit the ground running um, when it comes to software and computing, because the timeline uh, for deliverables for the electron ion collider is uh, extremely um, ambitious. Um, so luckily, we were not starting from scratch. We had a lot of experience. Um, starting in the EIC software consortium, the software working group, and doing simulations for the L report, and then finally the detector proposal period when things really got kicked into high gear. During the detector pro uh, um, proposal period, two of the three big proposals um, really did a lot of work on software. The Athena collaboration, or uh, protocol collaboration, successfully built and deployed what we could call a prototype modular software stack based on modern nuclear and high energy physics packages, you know, things like DD4HEP, EDM4HEP, and PodIO, Gaudi, et cetera. While the Etche uh, protocol collaboration really leveraged familiar legacy NP software to ensure that they could hit their milestones um, um, with uh, minimal risk, with the intent to reevaluate the stack going forward. So, you know, both groups of developers were actually very open to um, to to come from the, the the you know the experience that we we just had to try to actually build something nice for the EIC. The ICUG really played an important role there, organizing the series of these workshops. Um, the software effort in the EIC is a community effort. Um, we really you know went pretty quickly actually from this lessons learned process to then the, the, the formation of the, the software stack that we have at uh, Epic. Um, this process really laid the groundwork and it's uh, very nicely actually, you know, brought all the developers together. And, you know, from my own personal experience, I was quite impressed with how well we, even though we just came out of a highly competitive detector down select process, um, how nicely we all were able to work together and build up something nice. Um, one of the big components that went in all of this, including the EIC software statement of principles, is the EIC UG software working group's ongoing effort towards uh, user centered design. Um, we have now twice conducted a state of the software survey of um, all of the EIC UG members, where we collected information on software tools and practices first during the yellow report period, and again, after the detector proposal period. So we can think of that where we like to think about this, that we're sort of doing a software census and looking at, uh, you know, what people use and how they feel about using things and what's, what issues they encounter. And also who is working on different things. Based on the first state of the software survey, we actually organized a, um, um, set of focus group discussions where we had diverse focus groups uh, made up out of students, junior postdocs, senior postdocs, professors, staff scientists, as well as people that left our field after their PhD, so people that are in industry now. Um, each of those were a different focus group that we had dedicated sessions with for a couple of hours. The feedback we got out of that was extremely valuable. And that uh, provided inputs to the development, which is still somewhat ongoing, of uh, a set of user archetypes 
um, that we can use as inputs to the software development process. Uh, you can see here a, you know, a, a nice picture um, of one of the archetypes, um, which is the software is a part of my research archetype. So it's the kind of person that sees, you know, software really as part of their, their research, as opposed to someone that sees software as just a necessary tool or that rather would not see it, like to see software. Um, I would assume that we'll probably hear quite a bit more in detail about this soon because there's some interesting things that we're, we're learning out of this. So this then led to the EIC software statement of principles. Um, Mark has already gave a very nice introduction on this. Um, it was really meant to form a sound foundation to design our software stack. And I think it's important to stress that this was a community document. This went through the entire EIC community as well as actually outside of the EIC community in many rounds of suggestions and then finally an endorsement round. We got endorsement by a large uh, group representing really the international EIC community, where we're happy to say that 100% of the responses on the endorsement poll were positive. People could decide to not endorse it um, in the poll. No one did that. So there's a nice big list of people that endorsed this. Um, so how did we uh, go from the statement of principles to, um, you know, some of the design criterions or arguments for, you know, picking a certain design? Um, so some of the things to take away from the principles is that um, we have provisions for screening rate out from the start. That is very important um, for how we will actually do things at the electron ion collider. Um, we from the start, want to make sure that our software design choices are not intrinsically limiting what systems we can run on, including you know, being able to leverage future high throughput or high, high performance computing facilities where, where necessary. Um, our design should be very resilient against changing requirements, which we can accomplish by building really a, a toolkit of orthogonal components. Uh, one of the things we want to keep in mind is that we're designing, doing a lot of design work right now, but the EIC will run you know, in over 10 years from now. And um, there will be changes in different computing systems, et cetera, that we may not always be able to predict. So the best way um, to, to protect ourselves against this is to really get a resilient modular uh, software stack. So we don't, um, we don't immediately lock ourselves into 2022 technology. Um, what other big, um, you know, the big, uh, big component, of course, is user-centered design. Users should not need to know the entire tool chain to make meaningful contributions to a single component. I think that's a really important one because that is, you know, a, a strong protection against coming up with something that is highly monolithic. Uh, mon modularity really helps here because, well, if we plan this right, we're able to come up with, you know, a patchwork of modular tools that are nice and orthogonal where you know, be changing a geometry of a detector only requires you to know the tools to change the geometry of a detector and nothing else. Um, we will, you know, this together with the other principles may should make it easy for people to get started, which means we need to avoid unnecessary, you know, requirements that we put on people to 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 get started, um, you know, before they have enough buy-in to be able to do any kind of contributions to the software. So for the data format uh, points, um, so we tend to favor simpler, flatter data structures over more hierarchical data structures, uh, not necessarily hierarchical, but you know, complex object-oriented structures to um, at least lower the bar of entry for the users. So we're really strongly favoring storing things as tables or tables of tables, um, which, should make it much easier to get some multidisciplinary co collaborations. For example, with data scientists, um, where we've had some successful collaborations already of people, you know, doing analysis on our simulation results using, you know, tools like Uproot and Pandas without ever having to touch any of the, you know, the traditional root-based or C++-based workflows or even root Python based workflows. So uh, we really want to enable different ways uh, that people can interact with our data without prescribing per se, the one golden way within our framework that fits. And finally, there is the reproducible software. We really, you know, data and analysis <clears throat> preservation is a hard problem. It's rarely effectively addressed, 
we will consider this from the start and hopefully learn from the different efforts that have happened in the past. This also in, includes reproducibility of the software. And then finally, we have some points about the community as well as um, production readiness of the software stack. So um, we can use existing community tools where possible. This um, really helps you know, address a whole bunch of points from these principles. So um, we want to uh, you know, use big, well-established software projects as basis for what we're doing rather than reinventing the wheel and making all sorts of ill-designed unsustainable little projects. Um, so this way we can focus less collaboration resources on what I call framework level tasks and more on actual content level tasks where um, we can draw on many more collaborators that you know, once these things are established can actually work within these boxes. Um, we, of course, believe in an open source model It has worked really well in particle physics. Um, so we really want to emphasize open development, um, which also automatically helps at different levels with career supports of scientists uh, that dedicate their time on the software. And finally, we do have deliverables. We have a very aggressive schedule for the um, EIC critical decision process. We need to make sure that all of our new developments go hand in hand with continuous reliability to ensure EIC detector and science program, um, which means that we really need to at all costs avoid having any kind of regressions based on, you know, for example, improvements um, that we do know we, we need to take, make um, or, you know, refactorings we know we have to do in the, in the long run. Um, this should you know, be partially helped by sticking strictly to a very strongly modular approach. Okay, so uh, maybe a word about streaming readout. I'm not really the ex uh, an expert on streaming readout, but there's some other people in this call that could field um, quest questions uh, asked on this topic. Um, for the EIC, we really want to have a very strong integration of the DAC analysis and theory chain um, into you know something that we think about in a holistic fashion rather than something that um, you know comes with these discrete steps here the deck stops here we have our analysis and here we have our theorists that wait 10 years to to look at the data so we aim for a research model with more a seamless style of processing from sensor through deck to analysis and theory um, this is something that we need to consider from the start um, and this actually helps us build a better detector um, that supports streaming readout and fast algorithms, um, which will be hugely beneficial when it comes to actual data taking at the electron ion collider. Um, streaming readout and AI, of course, work hand in hand to enable a rapid turnaround from data taking to physics uh, analysis and publications. Okay, the path to a unified EPIC software stack. Um, so, we're talking really here about software for our future at the EIC. The proposal period saw a fragmented approach, just by necessity. We had different groups um, working independent of each other, competing for the um, um, the um, down select of the EIC detector. Um, people there, you know, some people invested in bigger frameworks. There were standalone tunes. There was fast simulation done. Um, all of that, you know, worked at the time when it was appropriate, but right now we really need to unify our efforts and our resources to make the EIC detector itself a success. Um, we strongly believe that we can use the EIC software statement of principles to guide this. That's one of the reasons that they are there in the first place. And um, we will embrace these practices today to avoid starting our journey to EIC with technical debt. So, we're trying to write software for the future, not the lowest common denominator of the past. We have this opportunity to, you know, write for a brand new accelerator and brand new detector right now, which is very exciting. So um, who is in the Epic software and computing teams? Well, there's a lot of people in there. Here, I'm just showing the conveners of the uh, relevant working groups. Um, and we have, you know, people from um, both US-based and non-US-based. We have people from labs and universities. We have a quite nice group um, of, uh, of people leading this effort. Um, so 
how do we get to the software stack? So what was the critical path that we traveled? Well, we set this, you know, originally five-step process, but since we completed the five steps, I added a sixth step here at the bottom. Um, starting with assessment of software solutions, you know, think pro and con lists together with uh, SimQA, but also the data acquisition working groups and guided by the software principles. Um, we then this summer proposed the conclusion and recommendation on the core components of the stack to the collaboration. We then very strongly felt that the software choice should be treated as any other detector technology choice. So we had an independent review of the software in the summer, which went very well. And once the decision was made, all new development went into the official framework and we rolled out the official software by October, let's say October slash November 23, so very recently. And we used the full new software stack for our latest uh, simulation productions quite successfully. And right now we kicked off a next steps process starting in, um, sorry, this should be 22, of course, not 23. Um, this has already happened. Um, we kicked off uh, the next steps process starting in December, so just now, um, and I'll get back to that in a future slide. So how do we pick our decision-making process? So um, the, we did it as follows. So we publicized the schedule of topics with dates of discussion and decision. For each of these different topics, we assigned a chair, and the chair is a person of contact for the topic. The chair responsibilities were to organize the session agenda, publish a draft list of requirements of the software being discussed at least one week in advance, which was then discussed in the collaboration, form a list with at least one choice for the software to adopt to address this topic, um, collect suggestions for modifications to the requirements as well as the software choices, and then finally lead the discussion on the topic, starting with the requirements and the list of options. Um, presentations can then be made regarding a specific decision topic, but they also should be communicated to the discussion lead in advance for purpose of scheduling. Um, we use the guiding principles from the software statement of principles. Discussion was required on all topics. Formal presentations weren't nece necessarily always done, but there was always discussion. Um, sometimes the presentations weren't really needed anymore. And based on the meeting, the conveners of the software and computing working groups um, proposed a consensus solution, which was then open for comments and endorsement by the collaboration for one week. And that process worked really nicely. Um, the really the, the big topics that we ticked right away was things like code repository, geometry, data model, which actually saw two weeks of discussion as well as reconstruction framework, which also saw two weeks of discussion. Um, so with all these major topics um, addressed, and I will get back to them in the next slides, what we actually discussed for these different topics, um, we went now into the next steps process. So for reconstruction, to meet our timeline, some compromises had to be made, and we want to make sure that we are not accumulating technological debt. So we're carefully reviewing all the choices we made and looking at places where modularity can be improved. Um, we had some discussions already on data analysis and analysis preservation. Um, that is something that um, we have a task force for. I will get back to this um, as well in a few slides. Um, there's a topic of documentation, in particular unified documentation, automatically generated documentation, up-to-date documentation we still need to have. Um, we do extensively use testing and CI workflows, but a lot of that is inherited from the uh, proto collaboration period, and this needs um, some more rigorous uh, discussion in the collaboration, as well as enforcing of what kind of strategies we actually want to follow here. Um, we need to have a discussion on conditions and calibrations and interfacing that with the entire reconstruction framework, as well as on software licensing and a plethora of other topics that I didn't write on this slide. So at the ground of it all lies the detector. And for the detector, we needed a geometry description as well as a detector interface. For this, we picked TD4HEP as a tool to describe the detector geometry and to provide this interface to the reconstruction algorithms. The entire EPIC geometry right now is implemented in two competing versions to compare some key technological uh, differences um, in db 4 um, I'm going to emphasize in these slides parallels with the Key4Head project. Um, we 
very actively talked with Key for Hep. The software stack used by Athena was very similar to the Key for Hep stack, and we had good experiences with that, that back in those days. Um, so um, it is nice to look at you know where we are really paralleling things that are happening in the HEP community and where maybe we're diverging and why we would be diverging. About the data model, we um, decided to leverage the existing PodIO and EDM for HEP projects to provide a standardized flat data model available to researchers with, you know, it can be accessed with researcher, uh, to researchers with modern AI ML tools um, due to the, 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 the structure, the way that we're structuring the data on a variety of hardware and software systems. So this is the same as key for hep However, for those aspects that are not an EDM for hep due to scope considerations, we will extend the data model with our own data definitions, EDM for EIC. And we were, you know, one of the groups that pushed for EDM for HEP to become extensible, which it is right now. Um, the standard data model for EIC will allow modularity and experimentation with new methodologies for data analysis, because this is really, you know, a component that's orthogonal to the framework choice or orthogonal to um, a lot of the different choices for tools. And I also want to emphasize that we've had some, you know, very productive two-way communication with the uh, key for HEP project. Reconstruction framework. So this was a very difficult and heated discussion. In the end, we decided to uh, select the uh, JANA2 framework as the reconstruction framework for the electron ion glider experiment um, based on the carefully formed set of requirements by the EIC software community, as well as some very nice guarantees by Jefferson Lab about formal support for the JANA2 framework. This choice is manifestly different from key for hep where um, the choice fell on Gaudi. Um, so this th is, you know, something we want to mitigate somewhat. Um, we did develop the JAMA based EIC recon software, which is a first functional prototype of the reconstruction software written within the JAMA 2 context. And it's been used successfully for the latest productions. However, we are actually using still quite some you know, common tools within the uh, reconstruction context. So we are using ACTS um, for tracking, which is treating us quite well. And we are exploring next steps, ensuring the use of generic framework independent algorithms to enable algorithm sharing. So really we're talking about, you know, um, algorithm sharing across, you know, experiments and frameworks. And this is something where we're working on a prototype right now and evaluation of if this is a route we want to take is still going on. Some brief thoughts on community software. So we're using many HTTP community packages like db4hep, ACTS, pod.io, you know, and many more that are really entrenched like Sham4, Roots, et cetera. Um, using generic packages really has been highly successful so far. Uh, we've had quick development turnarounds, good two-way engagement with developers. However, I did want to mention for this meeting in particular that there are some common hurdles that we encounter in a lot of different software packages. And part of them are with respect to the differing assumptions between what a detector really looks like, in particular, a particle physics or high energy physics detector, which differs a little bit from a nuclear physics detector. The electron ion collider has electrons and ions, which is asymmetric beams. beams therefore, a detector is asymmetric. A lot of software packages a priori assume that the detector is a, you know, a collider detector is symmetric. That's not the case for EIC. Um, another assumption that we're still somewhat struggling with um, is that um, we have two beams that cross each other at an angle that is you know, done for practical considerations, getting these collisions with, um, um, with um, electron and ion beams. So they're at an angle, which is something that needs to be considered for tracking, in particular if you're tracking pretty far away from the uh, solenoid where both beams do not take the same trajectory. That's some, something that you know we are still trying to solve within the context of the software. And there are some other examples of this um, that I, but uh, I think these are very nice. You know, sort of the the big two. Our track, our detector is asymmetric, and our beams sit at an angle. That is not something that all software is assumed, and that's a limitation that we sometimes bump into. Okay, about software repository and continuous integration. This was the first discussion uh, we had. The software infrastructure will use a hybrid solution that combines the benefits of public uh, and accessible code repositories on GitHub with powerful and scalable backends 
um, with self-hosted GitLab servers for CI. Um, the reason for that is that we far exceed what we can get out of the free allocations of CI on GitHub. And we have a lot of you know, self-hosted GitLab servers and a CI backends with you know, thousands, of, uh, thousands of cores. Um, implementation of integration of GitHub CI with self-hosted GitLab servers seems to be working well. However, we're still exploring alternatives because there is a bit of a maintenance burden on trying to keep two different systems um, working nicely together. Um, okay, about artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, EIC is leveraging AI and ML from the start. Um, this is um, a snapshot from a slide from the, the AI ML talk during the software review where um, it was stated that the recently formed Epic collaboration is quite active in AI ML. Um, you could see Epic as one of the first experiments to be designed with the support of AI. Um, there's really a number of activities that is um, anticipated to grow in the next months. There is, you know, the, the way that the software stack is developed really, you know, makes it uh, much easier to collaborate with um, different AI ML tools, um, which uh, in particular benefit from being able to run better in heterogeneous environments, which are exactly the kind of environments that we're keeping in mind in our software design. Um, the large scale AI ML applications um, entail different infrastructure that needs some additional discussion. There's you know, some life cycle, some distributed training aspects, et cetera, that we haven't really gotten towards. But yeah, we're highly engaged as a community and uh, the AI for EIC working group is a good forum to address these topics. And there is a series of meetings that are being, being held about this. Okay, data and analysis preservation. So there is different aspects to uh, consider beyond the choice of software. Um, which includes policy decisions that will require endorsement from the collaboration as a whole and resources to back them up. We had, you know, uh, we had a meeting about this in the summer um, addressing this topic where we decided that we really needed more um, dedicated study before we could make, um, uh, give the collaboration a strong guidance. And for this, uh, we assigned a task force to this purpose. And the task force will be organized by interim colleagues until the official formation of a collaboration, which is going to happen really soon. Production strategies. So following the software decision schedule, the distributed workflow management system discussion was held, um, was supposed to be held in the forthcoming weeks. However, um, due to the enormous workload we had implementing different things, this didn't actually happen. Um, yet, we um, decided to fall back on technological solutions that were deployed by both protocol operations in the proposal stage, which we know are not adequate in the long term, but serve us well enough right now. But this is really a high priority topic and one of the first ones that we're going to be um, engaging in um, 2023. The ESC software and uh, computing community has engaged with development teams of available technologies, for example, Direct, Panda. And we're really um, going to uh, we're going to be evaluating a large amount of uh, possible solutions to to this issue. Um, it's of course non-trivial. We're working on a lot of different systems. Um, the majority of our computing is actually happening on OSG right now. Um, we need to uh, make some improvements in being able to run on um, run strong. Um, to more strongly leverage both uh, computing systems that host laboratories as maybe um, leverage uh, HPC facilities within our workflows in a targeted way. So th there's quite some thought that needs to go into this. Okay, so finally, what about a second detector? EIC has only one detector. Well, yes, that is true for now, but there's two interaction points and the community is pushing strongly for a second detector. Um, so what do our software choices say about the detector? Well, they actually don't really say anything. So nothing about the software toolkit we're designing is unique to detector one. Um, we're making the strong point of not making hard assumptions within a reconstruction framework, for example, of exactly what detectors are inside um, of the uh, geometry. That's what the geometry tool is for. 
So we explicitly expect that the toolkit will be used as a starting point for the Detector 2 software. Many decisions were taken to explicitly allow collaboration and even algorithm sharing with other NP and HEP experiments. Um, the EPIC software stack could be used even uh, for future NP experiments, even outside of the EIC, for example, the fixed target solid experiment at Jefferson Lab. So really the bottom line is Detector 2 can hit the ground running. There's really not that much that needs to be done um, if you look really at the, the table of the different components and what they would have to do. So, Finally, um, I thought a little bit about our journey to the unified EPIC software stack built on the shoulders of the protocol aberrations. The major components are in place. We have good alignment with the key for head project um, in a lot of places. Um, next steps process was just kicked off to tackle topics important to uh, get right early in the, in the process. Um, a lot of those a little bit more difficult um, than the, the choices that we really, you know, do or die had to take right now, um, but we'll be giving a lot of priority. And we need to balance new development with our imminent deliverables, which are happening on timelines of the order, you know, one year, two years, etc. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Sylvester. That was excellent. Questions, comments, and Attila has written a question uh, into the live notes. So Attila goes first. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, it was, uh, well, I, I was listening very intently because uh, I didn't hear about this this project before. But uh, uh, at the very beginning, then, uh, then you described how you want to go for as simple of a data structure as possible. There, I, I started wondering what this would mean for, uh, for the data format evolution, what we tend to call at the LHC a schema evolution, mm -hmm. you know, like changing mm -hmm. an electron is. Uh, but uh, then once I realized that the, your data format is based uh, or is meant to be based on EDM for HEP, well, I guess EDM for HEP has a solution for this, although I had to realize that I, I don't actually know what that solution might be. So I don't know exactly how the solution is implemented off the top of my head. Um, that's something that is very new, but it, it was a high priority of the EDM for HEP project when we are having this discussion. And it was one of the, um, of course, key things that we needed to um, to make sure that was really in place, that we could have uh, you know, schema evolution going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was absolutely a consideration. Okay, thanks. I, I also have some other technical questions, but uh, if anybody else has something, then. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Atul. Um, so uh, this is a really a very technical question. You mentioned that uh, in order to, to use your own private runners with GitHub, which I, by the way, the setup I think is the correct one of, of putting the code into GitHub and then trying to, to use your own private runners for the CI that I, I'm very much on board with. I just, so I know that at CERN, we do use this sort of weird setup that, that you described of, of uh, running our own private version of, of a GitLab service with, uh, with the runners assigned to, to, the, to that GitLab server and then propagating jobs from mm -hmm. github to gitlab but i always thought that this was uh, because we already had the gitlab runners in place i heard about some security considerations at cern that yeah there are also some considerations like that for why we are not just running dedicated github runners on site mm -hmm. but is that why you you guys also had to to do this combination of GitHub GitLab? Because I, yes, I thought... it's exactly the same reason. We had a dedicated GitLab server that we used during the detector proposal periods at Argon, and we have quite a big backend there that we you know that we want to keep using. But it's non-trivial to convince our admins to migrate to use to hosting GitHub runners. So that's okay. why we're still using the server. So, and that's also why I said there's, you know, we're exploring other 
path forward because if you really use GitHub for everything, we should really figure out a way to use GitHub runners because this is you know making a few people's lives significantly more difficult. Okay, thanks, but but yeah, then it explains it. If you if you guys already had GitLab runners in place, yes, that explains it. Thanks. Other questions, comments? I have a quick question, Go ahead, over. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you, Sebastian, for this really nice uh, presentation. Um, so you, you, yeah, I was kind of interested and a little surprised at this, this statement about the, the differences between the uh, NP and, uh, and HEP uh, software with EDM for HEP. Um, I'm kind of curious how the process works. As you mentioned that there would be specific extensions for the um, for the um, EIC uh, stuff. So at some mm -hmm. point, does, does some of the software, would, would it get contributed back into the core software for yes. like DDM for HEP or? Yes. Yeah, so, for some uh, things, yes. For some things, maybe not. It depends. But DDM for HEP has been very open about, um, you know, absorbing things fast. Uh, we, especially right now, may need a quicker workaround than getting something officially in EDM for HEP, which is one of the reasons why having our own extension, you know, is helpful because we can test things out much quicker or um, have a slightly, you know, different variable set for a given detector where that, you know, getting that changed in EDM for HEP would actually, you know, require a discussion with multiple people. But EDM for HEP has been absolutely wonderful. You know, we're, we're having a seat at the table and um, they were even open to merging back in, you know, things like deep and elastic scattering type um, structures, which are really, you know, electron scattering specific. Very nice. Okay, yeah, that's that's great to hear. Um, if, if you can indulge me with just one other quick question while I have the floor. Um, is, there, is there a plan for, um, uh, for ensuring uh, compilation of the software on um, architectures like ARM, for example? Um, are you trying to build that in from the beginning? We should. We don't have that right now, uh, mostly because we don't have uh, ARM backends to do this on. Um, but that is something that, you know, even with the new MacBooks um, is becoming a topic that we're, you know, either we need to run through emulation, but it's better to really from the ground up support these different, these different ar um, uh, architectures. Sort of as an interim, we do have tests with different compilers already in mm -hmm. place, but we're, we're not really cross compiling at this, at this stage. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I agree with you. It'd be great to build that in probably from the beginning. All right. Thanks very much again. Thanks. You're welcome. Good questions. Questions, comments? No more? Okay, uh, that's it for today. We don't have our traditional three speakers. We have two, so we're actually ending in good time, which we haven't done in a long time. Um, so thank you again to our speakers uh, for really interesting talks looking ahead to uh, EIC software. And um, our next meeting in this series will be on January 17th, where we'll have our traditional uh, year in review from HSF, JLab, and BNL, but also given that it's in the new year, um, looking ahead to plans for 2023. Um, Marcus, anything to add? Only that Vauta has its hand raised. Oops. Yeah, I missed I'm that. Walter, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just raised it uh, literally when you were ending the speaking. Um, I was wondering. So, so following up on Attila's um, question on on the GitHub runners, um, I am I, I have not found um, a a complete enough solution to running GitHub runners um, in a way that HPC sites and large computing providers would be would be happy with. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone else is a, is aware of um, of large projects that are doing that. I, I personally, I think that the fact that GitLab is an open platform just allows for more of this kind of development. 
and and that that's probably why you know exascale projects are are focusing on that rather than the github runner approach but you're right that if there is a project that, that focuses on github runners we would probably consider it maybe even maybe for only part of our um or ci workloads um and i think it would be probably similar for other projects so so i'm i'm wondering if anyone or maybe attila if you have a, a comment on that no literally the, the what i just know about this is that this is what we do currently as well uh, uh, whenever we want to to send jobs from github to some specific cern machines we have to do this two-step thing and it it is pretty painful every time that we have to set this up again it it, it is just painful but uh yeah other than uh, from the user experience uh this not being great uh, again i heard that uh, that cern it was also not too keen on uh, on on starting uh, the sort of demons that that would be needed uh, for github but but, but that's all that I know about it. Unfortunately, I, I don't know about any uh, any HEP project that would have actually picked up on native GitHub runners. Uh, yeah, at, at the same time, I, I think still, even though I, I myself tend to use gitlab.com for a couple of things, I think the choice of using github.com was was still the right one. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Martin. Um, Final call for questions, comments? Anything you want to add beyond that, Marcus? No, nothing. Thanks for sharing, Torres. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you, everybody, and have a restorative, happy holiday season. So long, everybody. Bye-bye.